Uh, got it. Oh, you missed the preamble. <laughs> um, what, what I'm about to um, talk about today is really uh, something that is, oops, sorry, uh, let's see if we can move forward. Oh, okay. Um, which comes out of a kind of chapter that I have uh, recently published with a former PhD student of mine, Stan Plakeman. Um, and it's a chapter that was driven by uh, a group uh, in the UK that is trying to distill, funded by the EPSRC, which is trying to distill what are unique about human learning and reasoning systems that need to be captured by, um, you know, 21st or 22nd century artificial intelligence. Um, and I have to admit that I, I, I did what you're not supposed to do is I decided what my conclusion was going to be for this chapter, namely that human learning is slow, before I actually went out and did the literature review. And then I learned that actually when I reviewed the literature, the picture is a lot more mixed, um, that there is some evidence of, of fast learning and some evidence of slow learning. And actually, the distinction between them plays very well into the distinction that was put or put to me uh, about what the basic questions of this kind of seminar series are. Like, are there qualitative and quantitative differences between learning and reasoning? Uh, and my conclusion will be yes, very much so. And that is reflected by the difference between very rapid one shot or um, small data set learning and what I'll say, the, call the majority of slow learning. So that's the kind of background. Um, so as I said, it's commonly uh, held in the, world, in the world of, or believed in the world of AI and machine learning that humans, uh, I'm just going to try to get rid of all these little people so I can see my slides. There we are. Um, so that, hum that, that humans um, you know, are able to do very fast or rapid one-shot learning. This characterizes human intelligence and other species can't do that. And it's also used to appeal against the use of neural networks or statistical learning accounts of human cognitions um, because those need a lot of data to kind of extract generalities. And so one of the things I wanted to explore was how well-founded these beliefs were. You know, what is the evidence in support of this or against this? So that is partly what I will be um, reviewing um, in this talk. Um, so what I'll ask in, in four or five different sections is whether there is any evidence uh, of one-shot learning in humans and how strong this evidence is. Uh, does it, you know, is it specific to very young infants, children, or adults? Um, I'll ask whether it requires kind of a dedicated learning mechanism uh, or whether it could be a byproduct of a kind of general learning mechanism. Um, I'll then explore what evidence there is of slow learning humans. You know, we, we're focusing here from an AI perspective, we're focusing here on this need for, for rapid one-shot learning. Um, you know, perhaps there's a lot of space for slow learning, which also plays an enormously important role in, in human cognition. Um, I'll then review quickly some evidence of whether it's uniquely human or not, um, and then kind of ask some questions based on literature about what might make for rapid learning. So when do we engage in rapid learning and when do we not engage in, in rapid learning? Uh, at the end, I will actually also illustrate a, uh, provide an illustration of the kind of balance between rapid and slow learning in a kind of uh, new computational model that uh, Sam Blakeman and I have developed. Um, okay, so let's start with, with rapid learning, right? What, is there any evidence of rapid learning in human infants um, and, and adults? Um, so the classic example of this is kind of fast mapping and word learning. So it, it, it's, you know, since the late 70s, early 80s, there's lots of evidence that children appear to be able to learn new words very, very rapidly from very sparse language. So this is usually with either uh, you know, one to two year olds or, or even three year olds. And there are many um, types of paradigms for studying this. Most of these are match to sample or non match to sample type paradigms. So I'll give you a little, like, this is one example, but there's lots and lots of other uh, paradigms. Um, a young baby, an 18 month old, might first have a warm up trial where they're shown some pictures of some objects and they're told, you know, um, show me the spoon. Uh, this is the top layer. But um, by the way, Selma, nod if you, can, if you can see. Can you see my? pointer on this, yes, okay. So, um, uh, you know, in, in the first trials, they have a warm up or a practice trial, so they can show me the spoon and here it is, the child picks it up, points at it or looks at it. And then they're given a new learning trial and they will say, look, look at the Moog um, in the context of objects that the child may already know. Uh, and, and then there's a retention interval and there's a test trial and, they'll, uh, and the experimenter might say, well, show me, you know, wh where is the MOOC? 
Now, if you remember what happened last time, you would learn that Moog is mapped onto this object as a label on this object, and then hopefully the child can pick out this one from the distractors. And that the claim is that is indeed what, what happens. There's a lot of evidence uh, of this happening. It's been repeated or replicated quite a lot. Um, okay, so, um, you know, why would this work? Uh, there have been a number of suggestions as to mechanisms uh, that might uh, account for this. Uh, people like Linda Smith, for example, have suggested that there are some inductive bias, some very strong inductive biases at play, uh, in particular a shape bias. So we tend to generalize labels according to shape. Um, and so this kind of reduces the scope of possible inferences in these like really constrained types of problems where you choose one from three distractors, shape might be a good um, predictor of, of what the correct response is going to be. Um, now the question is, so as I said, there's a lot of evidence of this in word learning. The question is, is it unique to words? So is it a language specific type effect? Well, no, um, there is evidence of this rapid one-shot learning in slightly older kids as well, in terms of understanding the functional use of objects. Um, so for example, uh, Claeser and Kel Kelman um, found that uh, when children were shown the function or the use of an object of a new tool, they only needed one observation to infer uh, or to be able to use that tool uh, appropriately thereafter in the future, at least within the test session. So, you know, you, this is another example of one shot learning, one example, not in the language domain um, that, you know, young, young children uh, clearly have. Okay, so infants and kids might have have uh, fast mapping or one-shot learning. What about um, adults? Does this continue into adulthood? Um, it's often characterized as a feature of, um, of, of younger children. Um, and also because the original work was done on word learning, it's sometimes characterized as a, as a language specific effect. Um, but it turns out there's actually quite a lot of, or some evidence anyway, that uh, fast mapping can continue into adults, into adulthood, um, but it plays a different role here. Um, in this case, fast mapping uh, or the characteristics of fast mapping in terms of uh, EEG markers and reaction time markers are more consistent with fast mapping being associated with the rapid integration of a new piece of information within an extensive existing semantic memory network uh, within the cortex. So it's slightly different from uh, what's happening in, in childhood. Um, so while the rapid learning may be the hallmark of early development, it also continues into an adulthood, albeit as part of a slightly different learning process. It's doing something different in, um, it appears to be doing something different in adults. So um, just to summarize all of that, in young children, fast mapping is associated with rapid but short-lived learning of a label or a function. Um, in adults, fast mapping is associated with a quicker assimilation of new knowledge into an existing semantic knowledge base. So, um, you know, as I said right er early on, uh, when I was came to write this chapter initially, I wanted to show there was very little evidence of, of one shot or fast, fast mapping or one shot learning. Um, but there is, you know, definitely out there robust evidence of uh, this kind of learning occurring. Um, yeah. Okay. Would it require a rapid um, a specific learning mechanism, for example? I mean, is it, again, this kind of comes out of the tradition, the question of, of the fact that if it's associated with word learning with language and language is somehow a special ability, maybe there is a specialized uh, learning mechanism. Um, also because the kind of learning trajectory of only requiring two or three examples seems to be very different from the kind of uh, common incremental learning trajectories of kind of traditional associate, uh, associative learning accounts. So, um, you know, Thorndike or, or, or others. Um, and the question, you know, there are of course models with specific mechanism, but the question is whether a general learning mechanism would show the same sorts of, or could show the same sorts of uh, phenomena. Um, and Bob McMurray suggested that actually models of incremental learning could predict um, that uh, the presence of fast mapping as well as slow mapping. Um, so really a, a kind of associative learning model would suggest that kind of learning times, learning rates would be normally distributed around the mean and there should be tails. Um, there should be evidence in which some words that you're learning would actually be learned very rapidly and some learn, uh, some, some words that are being learned would be learned very slowly. Um, you know, so you'd have the kind of two tails of the, of the distribution. So is there any evidence of this rapid kind learning uh, of learning? 
Well, again, there was a bit of evidence of this in the early noughties. Um, Dieck and Wagner, for example, found that five-year-olds learned some words. They looked at the learning, the number of exposures required to learn new words, and they found that four, four and five-year-olds uh, learned some words very slowly, whereas others uh, very rapidly. So it wasn't that all words were learned equally, as it were. There was this kind of distribution, which is more characteristic of a kind of generalized um, associative mechanism. Um, also, uh, it wasn't specific to words. Uh, Dieck as well found that kind of when, when children were either learned word, sorry, learn words, were, were taught words or facts or, pic, or, or new pictograms, the words were actually learned more slowly, they required um, more examples than just abstract facts or sorry, concrete facts um, or pictograms in these studies. Um, and uh, so again, you know, this, it's not just Diak, but Martin and Bloom also found uh, when uh, teaching children uh, facts about objects or names about objects that uh, the fast mapping uh, could occur not just for words, but with facts as well. So again, it's not just uh, a word specific thing. Um, and it does seem to have a kind of distribution in terms of uh, the amount of learning that's required to learn um, facts or words or labels or pictograms. Okay, so fast mapping is not specific to words and it does not necessitate any kind of special purpose mechanism. Instead, the conclusion that can be drawn from this literature is that the domain, domain general associative mechanism could give rise to the apparent fast mapping when there's a match between new material to be learned and the previous knowledge is highly consistent. So this, this means it can be incorporated, as we'll see later, kind of incorporated within the existing knowledge base more quickly and attached um, yeah, to, to that existing knowledge base more quickly. Okay, so um, we talked about fast mapping. There is evidence, uh, you know, rapidly, there, there's strong evidence of uh, fast mapping existing, at least in the word domain, um, and existing in, in for learning functions um, of tools. Uh, there may be specific, you know, domain specific mechanisms, but a general uh, domain general uh, gradual learning mechanism could also account for these observations of the rapid learning of some objects. Um, so let's now turn, you know, turn the question on its head and ask, you know, how much evidence there is for slow learning, right? So as I said right at the beginning, if you're faced with the coal mine of teaching children things or teaching adults things for that matter, but we're focusing on children here, um, you, you realize that there is a lot. Of, of repetition that, that is uh, required in getting uh, learning to uh, off the ground. Um, so one key point that's been made is that um, the learning the labels, which is what we're doing in these kind of word fast mapping type tasks, is non-matched to same samples, you know, show, show me the globe, uh, is not really the same as learning the concept that underlies those labels, right? Labels are far easier to learn. Concepts are, are vaguer, uh, have many, many dimensions and contexts, and much harder and, and slower to learn. So the standard task used to evaluate uh, fast mapping or rapid learning uh, or one-shot learning in kids, the kind of matching or non-matching to sample uh, type tasks I described at the beginning um, are really very, very um, artificial and constrained because for one thing, there's a small number of reference that the child can choose from um, in the final test phase. So one possibility is that uh, in if um, the kind of same kind of adult level of difficulty, sorry, the, the level of difficulty that we see in kind of adult concept learning tasks was um, provided or given for the uh, to the children, um, we may find that the children even in, in that context are are learning as slowly as um, adults might be, and indeed, if one uh, goes back to the original fast mapping study. Uh, by Karen Bartlett. This is a, a famous chromium study where they introduced the word chromium um, and uh, they asked the children uh, you know, to identify the chromium. Only a small minority of the three-year-olds uh, uh, successfully identified the chromium. So there was some evidence of fast mapping within their task for the three-year-olds, but actually the majority of the children um, did not really identify what the intended me meaning, the color of uh, the term was. So um, if we if we kind of take the word learning as as a, uh, a kind of domain or case case study, um, 
it looks like there are many, many things going on simultaneously in the word in the word learning domain. Um, so word learning can be, uh, for example, described as a sequence of events. There might be an initial fast mapping um, process in which the children first link um, between the phonetic form or the, the, the form of the word and the reference. Uh, they make a very rapid link of uh, that. And then there's a slow mapping process that builds this association into an existing um, semantic network or episodic memory. So how do I, if I learned that this, this green blobby thing is a Moog, I can learn that very quickly, but what is slow is integrating that association between the blobby thing and the Moog into some kind of um, semantic organization of the world. Um, so the, the gradual learning, which follows the fast mapping, links the reference um, to word form and refines these links via statistical learning and slow accumulation of small bits of knowledge. So next time I encounter a Moog, you know, I understand the context, maybe it's function a bit more and so forth, and it enriches the kind of network of uh, semantic associations linked to that. Um, so, in fact, so Monroe uh, kind of looked at how uh, robust these fast mapping associations were in children. And he found that actually, yes, kids could, young children, three, four, five year olds, I think these were, um, oh, no, these, sorry, these must be three year olds, they could pick out um, you know, what the Moog was, this uh, new word, this new label. Um, but they didn't retain that association very long. So even five minutes later, their performance was um, substantially um, decreased. So five minutes later, the likelihood of picking out the Moog um, was, was far lower. Okay? So this rapid learning of, of a, a association of a label and a, and a reference and an object um, is only, it appears to be transient um, and not long lasting. Um, so just to summarize this section, um, you know, even word learning, which is the characteristic example of fast mapping, even word learning has a slow and a fast component. Uh, the fast and short-lived labeling can happen on the basis of a few examples, but deeper word, word learning in terms of re, uh, understanding the semantics, the reference and how it associates to uh, the broader kind of semantic uh, knowledge that we have or our episodic experiences, uh, takes much longer and uh, needs time to be consolidated. Um, labels that are not assimilated within this existing rich semantic networks are quickly forgotten. So we, we learn something quickly, but if it's not repeated or made to be relevant in some way, it gets forgotten. Um, okay, so let's step away from um, fast uh, mapping, sorry, from, from words and language and so forth, and, and concepts, which is really where this debate has been played out the, the most, in, 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 at least in the developmental literature. And let's look at other forms of learning, because of course a, there are lots of other different learning systems um, that may have different um, characteristics as well. And I think if we're trying to capture, this is from the kind of human-like computing perspective, we're trying to capture, um, you know, what it is to have human intelligence, we need to capture not just the kind of higher cognitive, but also the kind of supporting um, perceptual and motor skills that, that go with that. Um, so perceptual learning, um, the ability to classify or discriminate um, things on the basis of similarity, um, also uh, can be broken down into um, some, an initial rapid and then a slow consolidation phase. Um, in most perceptual learning tasks, there's an initial within first session learning, very rapid within session learning, where probably the participants are just uh, determining what the relevant dimensions of the problem are, um, which allows them to improve in performance within that task. And that is followed by relatively slow learning of uh, the improvement in performance in classification, for example, of the images on the right here as belonging to a, you know, family A, B, or C. Um, and that's accumulated over many, many training sessions or uh, many training days. Um, so the long-term retention is acquired through long, slow practice, um, even if there is a very rapid initial improvement in performance right from the first trial. Um, so one of the interesting things about the perceptual and, and motor skill learning uh, domains as well is that you can actually get very slow um, improvement in performance that occurs between training sessions. So learning is occurring even without the kind of reward presentation 
um, happening you know, within an experiment and so forth. So you're consolidating um, your uh, representations of what is meaningful um, in these tasks between sessions. Um, similarly to motor skill learning, uh, there's lots of evidence in, in the motor skill uh, domain of a similar dissociation between fast and slow learning. Um, so skill learning is, is, a, is also considered to be a multi-step process that can be reduced to the acquisition of one episode only. Um, when practicing a motor skill, perf um, performance improves asymptotically. Uh, um, so you very rapidly and quite rapidly reach an initial level of performance. Um, and this is kind of described as the fast learning stage in this literature. Um, but the motor control and the motor memory um, continues to improve over long and extended periods of practice and can happen like with perceptual learning between the actual training sessions as well. So your performance, um, your motor performance will actually be better on a second trial, even though there hasn't, or a training session, even though there hasn't been um, any additional uh, training between the different sessions. Um, so there seems to be a need for a consolidation time between sessions for durable learning, motor learning to occur um, as well. Okay, so to kind of summarize a little bit where we're at um, here. Um, so there is in, you know, a, a review of the literature suggests that there is evidence of fast learning occurring in infants, children, and adults, um, but this is not um, unique to word or concept learning. Uh, it occurs in other domains as well. Um, and it doesn't require positing a specialist mechanism. It can be explained also by kind of distributions in a uh, gradual generalist learning system. Um, and even the canonical task that's used to kind of identify uh, fast mapping or rapid learning, which is basically uh, word learning, um, typically has a fast labeling phase followed by a slow assimilation phase in which the new word is assimilated with an existing knowledge. Um, and if it's not assimilated, it just disappears as well. So if you don't have the slow learning phase to consolidate this uh, knowledge, um, it, the association just disappears. Um, and as we also saw very briefly, of course, kind of slow learning is the defining trait of many other forms of learning, such as motor and perceptual skill learning, as well as I haven't touched on this, as well as uh, you know more complex expertise typical of intelligent human behavior. So you know chess playing, piano playing, and, and so on. Um, really, expertise. There's a rule of thumb um, or. or uh, expertise requires that 10,000 hours of practice to actually become an expert at um, these sorts of complex uh, human activities. So I'm afraid um, if only I could learn to be an expert chess player in two or three trials, that would be wonderful. But it's not the way the, the world works. Um, okay, so so there is fast mapping, fast learning. It's a it must be accompanied by uh, extensive slow learning in order to have any impact on lo our long-term behavior, which ultimately is what learning is about, in my opinion, our future behavior. Um, you know, but is this fast learning um, you know, unique to humans, as is claimed by some uh, members of the uh, kind of um, AI and cognitivist community here, to be, I'll be perfectly honest here, I'm thinking about people who work um, often in kind of the, the Northeast of the United States, MIT, Harvard um, kind of, of crowd. Um, so uh, the answer, the short answer is, is it um, present only in, in humans? The answer is no. There's plenty of evidence of one-shot learning uh, as well, or, or a few example learning in lots of different um, species. Famously, there's Kaminsky, the border collie, um, who can do one-shot word learning. Um, uh, so basically the same thing that was done with children, where they're introduced, you know, a new object or a new word is introduced in the context of objects that the child already knows, and the child maps that new sound, that new uh, word onto the new object. Uh, Rico, the dog, and this was a paper in Science in 2004, Rico, the dog, can do exactly the same thing, pick out the new object when asked to, you know, find the Moog, and Rico will pick out the, the toy on the floor that, um, you know, it doesn't already know the word for, and Rico, you know, built up to a vocabulary of about 200 different items. Um, so that's really quite impressive. Um, but it turns out there's not just, again, in word learning. Uh, there's plenty of other evidence that we're a little more broad-minded of um, 
one-shot learning. So rats, for example, can uh, do one-shot odor recognition. So this perceptual discrimination stuff. Um, single sniff, and they will discriminate and remember a particular item. Um, again, rats and lots of other animals uh, will show one-shot food aversion. Um, so if you associate a noxious element or put a noxious element um, in food that was previously uh, ap appealing to the rats, they only need to eat it once, um, get sick once, and then they permanently avoid that food. So this is conditioned food, uh, one-shot food aversion. Um, so that a single heart, a very strong negative experience is sufficient for the rat to avoid the substance in the future. Um, and surprisingly, it's surprising to me, maybe not to you guys, even insects, some insects can show one-shot odor recognition as well. So you don't need to have a very complicated cortex to um, show one-shot odor, uh, one-shot discrimination and recognition as well. Um, now, there are other species that, that learn very rapidly um, also from a few um, uh, exemplars, um, and it's often a form of um, social punishment. So uh, punishment and altruism are behaviors found in many species in which the collective good, i.e. the survival of the school of fish or the survival of the individual, uh, sorry, uh, the, the survival of the, of the collective outweighs the survival of the individual, such as the school of fish over the individual fish. In these kinds of animal communities, it's often found that punishment uh, occurs to extinguish behaviors that are dangerous to the collective. So, for example, overfeeding in an area is bad for the school as a whole. So if a fish um, is overfeeding, it'll be punished uh, through either physical punishment or exclusion uh, from the school, similarly uh, for establishing breeding hierarchies. So um, all of this happens very rapidly um, through only one or two examples, um, because otherwise the fish or the other animal basically dies and gets killed, right? So they require, um, in, in these sorts of um, punitive um, social contexts, one-shot learning is the rule. Um, and again, it's, it, it's long-term here. Um, uh, yeah. So what, what can we conclude from uh, this evidence of, uh, this rapid evidence of kind of uh, overview of the evidence of rapid learning in humans and non-humans? Um, so it turns out that rapid learning also occurs in non-human animals, um, sharing many of the characteristics of, of kind of human rapid learning. Um, so labeling events, whether through smell or audition and long-term retention of events with high reward value, I'm stressing high reward because we're going to uh, I'm going to come to the point that the reward value of events is what's determining uh, what kind of learning uh, takes place. So high reward values of punishment, such as social ostracism, is what determines the one-shot learning in uh, these animal species. Okay, so we've reviewed quite a few things. Uh, this, you know, there is evidence of some rapid learning, uh, which is short term. Uh, there's lots of evidence of long-term learning, semantic. Uh, but also in the perceptual and motor skill domains. Um, and I guess, <clears throat> you know, the question might be, well, well, what kind of makes, when do we do rapid learning? You know, what determines the balance between this short-term and rapid, um, this rapid learning and this kind of long-term, more gradual learning? Um, and uh, a couple of researchers have kind of tried to tease this apart, at least with, hum uh, with adults. I always say humans instead when I talk about adults. Um, in in ad human adults, uh, to determine kind of what, um, what are the causal factors here. Uh, so one of the um, conclusions from this is that strong relevant prior knowledge, so existing what, what they call existing knowledge structures allows, uh, that allows consistent material to be learned um, after very few presentations is one of the key predictors of whether rapid learning in adults is going to happen. So if you have a knowledge structure um, that is entirely consistent with the new piece of information. We simply have to slot that new piece of information within this existing complex knowledge structure, which can involve causal relations or other things like that. Then you get you, you see evidence of, of rapid learning, um, and um, also the existence of, of a complex knowledge structure um, in that particular do domain uh, might allow learning of the new item. Uh, with very few presentations, because you can draw on that knowledge to kind of rule out alternatives. So in a way, this is a generalization of the kind of mutual exclusivity uh, principle that, that uh, was actually at play in the first 
example I gave you where the child had to choose between the MOOC and, and two things it knew. Uh, mutual exclusivity is basically the idea that if you know what the name of, of you know, some of the objects are, and you're given a new name where you can exclude all the ones that you know, um, and you focus in on the only objects that you don't know the name of. So this is a generalization of that in the context of knowledge more generally. Um, so the idea that knowledge and a rich knowledge structure uh, is important in sustaining, uh, uh, in, in uh, promoting fast mapping suggests that it's this knowledge um, itself that's doing the heavy lifting in what we characterize as fast mapping. In fact, what's going on is inference um, about the stuff rather than kind of learning per se. Um, so this kind of comes back to the original question at the beginning about is there a link between um, learning and uh, reasoning? Um, absolutely. They, they, they interact with each other, but they play uh, different roles um, in uh, our discovery of, of information around us. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. So, um, you know, other than the fact there's a lot of knowledge, so how can we say, how, how, what's another way of saying, well, how does knowledge, the amount of knowledge that we have impact on whether we're going to engage in fast mapping or one-shot learning uh, or not? And um, Greaves and all have suggested the amount of uncertainty about a relationship between the items mediates the transition between incremental and um, one-shot learning. So basically, the more uncertain we are about something, this doesn't make sense, okay? The, the higher the learning rate is, the more we're likely to kind of uh, generate an episodic uh, memory of that or kind of a snapshot of that relation to um, process it later and see if it turns out to be a relevant association or not. Um, if on the other hand, this is a kind of an association that I have a lot of knowledge, I know a lot about, um, it's not particularly surprising. It'll just be processed by kind of slow, the, the, the standard slow uh, gradual learning um, uh, system. Uh, okay. So more uncertainty, if I'm not sure about this, I, I create a snapshot, which is basically a, a one-shot learning sort of exemplar, and then either let go of it <laughs> if it doesn't reoccur or use it to say train uh, my kind of semantic network gradually through a consolidation process as kind of described by McClellan, McNaughton and O'Reilly, people like that in their kind of complementary learning systems uh, accounts of, of learning. Um, so one particular prediction, so we were talking about the uncertainty, but what element of uncertainty are we focusing on? So one particular idea that's, that's gaining traction a lot, both in the kind of modeling circles and in the behavioral circles, is that it's the, the prediction or the reward prediction error, sorry, the prediction errors or the reward prediction errors that triggers whether we switch from a kind of rapid one-shot learning versus gradual learning. Uh, system. Um, when, when we have high uh, reward prediction error, that is, if the resulting reward of an action is not what we expected, then we learn that situation very rapidly, form a kind of episodic memory of it that we then use to support um, our uh, more general kind of semantic learning system. Um, the key idea here is that fast and slow learning are always occurring in tandem. In the brain. And I think that's a point that I'm going to come back to beforehand, that there are, of course, multiple learning systems with different characteristics and, tra and, and traits um, that operate in parallel and both support, uh, cooperate, but also compete uh, at various times. So slow and fast learning are always occurring in, in tandem. And um, according to one formulation, this is underpinned by interactions between the cortical and hippocampal system, where the hippocampal system creates snapshots, episodic snapshots. Um, that can be used to um, train or update gradual learning in uh, semantic kind of cortical regions. Um, and then, yeah. Um, so the key I wanna push here is the idea that uh, it's the kind of reward prediction errors that control the relative balance of fast and slow learning in the brain. So, so far, all I've done is kind of give you a very rough overview of uh, review of existing literature. Um, and what I'm going to do here is just tie into one particular example. And this is a computational example, computational modeling example of um, 
how these kind of systems might interact in a way that would be mutual benefic mutually beneficial for, for both of them. So here I'm going to talk about some work very rapidly uh, that was done as part of uh, Sam Blakeman, one of my recent um, PhD students who's now at Sony AI, um, some work he did as part of his PhD. And uh, one chapter of it was looking at, well, well, actually his PhD was looking at, you know, how can we improve learning in deep um, neural networks? Um, and not just improve learning, but improve maybe the transfer of knowledge from a deep neural network to something else. So one of the you know, critiques of these deep neural networks, um, you know, they, they can solve tasks, some tasks, um, especially perceptual motor tasks, um, very well, sometimes better than humans, um, but they are described as black boxes in that there's a lot of kind of neurons and weights and nobody really knows exactly how action decision, action selection decisions are made and so forth. So um, is there a way of getting an explanation out of these um, opaque deep neural networks in a way that will make them understandable to others, understandable to other systems, but maybe to humans as well. So that they could explain to, um, to, to humans, you know, what actions they took at what point. Um, so to do this, what uh, this is, I'm just giving a rough sketch and I've got two pictures of basically two sketches of the same model in two ways to do this. Um, what we, what um, Sam did is a uh, couple uh, deep neural network, uh, a Q learning network, but it's not a deep neural network. Um, so lots of layers, feed forward uh, network with next to it, a, a smaller um, self-organizing map. Um, and um, the idea was here was to mimic this um, complementary learning systems framework that you might have a, a very large semantic or cortical system that's gradually learning uh, facts or learning how to, um, uh, act on the world given a particular state of the world. And next to it is a smaller specialized uh, rapidly learning uh, hippocampal system, episodic system that, that uh, takes snapshots of certain uh, events in the world, certain times in the world, certain things that happen in the world. Um, and the key thing is that both of the weights in these two networks are updated by, uh, are, sorry, are determined by, um, uh, reward prediction error. So the the episodic memory here, the self-organizing organizing map, um, has a, a small number of units that come to identify points in the problem space where moments in the problem space, when I'm trying to solve a problem, I'm going to give you some examples. I'm, when the, net, the deep network's trying to solve a problem, but there are moments where it's really struggling. It's taking the wrong action. It's getting you know the wrong, um, it, 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 it's not getting the reward it was expecting. Um, and the self-organizing map, the episodic memory system will then record those particular things and what action was taken at that point. Um, and this is then used in conjunction with the general knowledge, uh, general, the, the slow generalization of the deep neural network um, to kind of avoid those pitfalls. So I've made that mistake before, I'm not going to make it again now, okay, uh, the next time. Uh, so you. The, the key point is you have a kind of interaction between a slow, gradually learning reward-based deep neural network and an episodic memory system, which is very limited capacity, but will pick out those key moments when the reward prediction is, is bad. Um, and I'll just illustrate two types of problems that uh, these networks were trained on. One of them was a standard maze task. So um, on the left here, we've got a maze. The, I, I can't remember where the start and the end is, but let's say the start was the green and has to move left, right, up, down um, through this maze to reach the rewards. And every time it hits one of the black bars, it loses some, some points. So it will ultimately get less uh, rewards. Um, and at the bottom, what we have here is just, I mean, you don't need to, the, the details are important, but what we have here is the complementary learning system with the two the normal deep network with the episodic memory as well, that's kind of identified places of poor reward, reward prediction. Um, this is the blue line and basically its performance um, is way better than the standard uh, deep neural networks, okay? Um, and then on the right, we've got a different type of problem. This is a continuous value problem. This is the, uh, uh, the continuous mountain pole cart um, problem. And the idea is you are controlling a continuous system, oops, um, uh, with a bar and you can move this bar left or right 
more to the left or more than right, which gives a direction and velocity to this cart that's in some kind of well. Um, and you need to try to push the cart up to a target point here. And there's, I don't, there are some videos of these, but basically there's, there's uh, gravity existing in this, in this, um, uh, in this well, and so the cart keeps kind of oscillating back and forth. And if you push it too hard, it'll go past the reward and fall off the cliff. So you need to be very careful about this. Um, and it's a classic control problem that's used in engineering all the time to test engineering things. It's also been used with, with humans um, to test um, implicit learning skills. And again, the blue line is the uh, complementary learning system, and it does much better than the standard um, uh, state-of-the-art uh, AI system uh, does. Uh, on this task. So the point to make here is that adding the additional learning system, which is fast and limited capacity, it learns instances of reward relevance and then uses those instances to help um, uh, actions, uh, to, to help uh, the learning in the, 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 the larger um, cortical system overcome kind of areas of the problem space that it was struggling with. Um, in both cases, the performance is much um, better than the standard neural network. And another thing you can do is you can say, well, wait a minute, when these networks, these complex networks like this, we're learning these tasks, okay, um, it, it will, the, the network will give you the sequence of steps it takes to reach the goal, but um, you don't really know what it's done, where and why, and what the important um, explanation might be. It doesn't know how to translate that expertise into an expert explanation for another user. So what you can do is you can use the um, episodic memory, and you take a network that uh, has solved this task, and then step through the problem again, get the network to step through its problem, and then see what particular flash uh, uh, um, snapshot memories the episodic memory has encoded, because these are ones where critical decisions needed to be made by the, the larger network. Um, and then just see what those actions are. And when you reconstruct those, what is effectively sequentially in time encoded in the episodic memory are ex um, explanations like this at critical points. Um, so, um, you know, at the beginning, for in this simple maze at the beginning, the, the episodic memory is saying go up. You know, when it reaches, when the network reaches this stage, there's no guidance in between, but when the, the overall system reaches this stage, the episodic memory says left, so it moves left, and then it keeps going and so forth and up. And so these are all the critical junction points that are encoded within the episodic memory, of points at which a critical decision needed to be made. Um, and similarly, we've got similar thing happening here. If you look through, um, you know, step through what are the specific uh, memories that are encoded in the uh, hippocampal, ep sorry, the, the self-organizing map episodic um, system, um, we can see that the actions that are encoded come at critical points where um, the, uh, you know, the, the pole cart needs to be moved back and forth in, in, at different times. Okay, so um, we can use this dual system not just to help learn better by memorizing the difficult uh, uh, episodes by creating episodic memories, but also we can use it to create um, explanations of what actions we undertook. Um, and in fact, this is this is very I discovered this is consistent with a kind of idea that um, Gergely Shibra and colleague had been putting together. Uh, they had a paper in Behavioral Brain Sciences where they argued that the role of um, episodic memory was specifically for communicating to other individuals. So in a different context from, uh, from our modeling here, um, uh, it seemed to kind of mesh quite well with, with what we were doing. Okay, so I'm gonna come up, I mean, I've been talking for about 50 minutes. Um, I'm going to kind of summarize a bit what uh, uh, I've tried to say. Um, so, you know, one-shot learning is far from, unlike, unlike what is being claimed in some, um, by some researchers, unshot learning is far from ubiquitous um, in humans. There's a lot of learning that is slow. Uh, fast mapping is almost always accompanied by slower, more gradual learning, and that is critical for the long-term retention. Um, when it is not accompanied, so when fast mapping is not accompanied by slow learning, new knowledge such as new uh, label values is quickly forgotten. So you need the slow learning for retention. Um, uh, and you know, 
fast mapping that is not accompanied by slow learning is closer or more akin to on the fly inference resulting from the application of strong prior beliefs rather than learning per se. It's actually the application of the knowledge, the reasoning, and not the learning phase per se. Um, so finally, one-shot learning is not unique to humans. One-shot learning is of questionable value, in fact, unless the event is of high reward. I mean, let's face it, if you had a system that was just creating episodic, you know, one-shot learning of everything it ever encountered, um, you know, we'd never get off the ground. So you need to select somehow what are the particular episodes or, or events or elements or facts that need to be encoded. Um, and, uh, you know, the relative reward or punishment value is, is a key for this. Um, and then ultimately one-shot learning is useful in order to hold an item in memory long enough to determine whether it has sufficient value to be stored in long-term memory. Um, if not, then it should be discarded as well. Um, so, I mean, this is slightly more tangential to what I was saying, related more to what the, the aims of the particular chapter was, but, um, uh, you know, some other conclusions that I want to push is the idea that intelligent behavior, human-like behavior is the product of multiple interacting system, learning system, well, inference and learning systems, but learning system, um, you know, the key to human intelligence uh, is the kind of parallel functioning of these multiple partially redundant systems. Uh, controlled behavior, which is what we observe and choose to describe as intelligent or not, is the result of both cooperation. Sometimes these systems cooperate, as in the modeling example I gave you, or compete. They try to pull behavior in different directions. Um, and focusing on a single aspect of human learning, such as fast mapping or one-shot learning, is unlikely to be fruitful in and of itself. Yes, it is one of the components, but that does not exist and function um, in isolation. So, I've been talking for, well, um, almost an hour, 15 minutes or so. Um, so I think that, that's all I was going to say. Um, thank you for your attention. This work uh, that I was describing here was actually funded by the BBSRC and the uh, EPSRC. And I'm happy to hear your, your comments or questions or anything. Um, as I should have mentioned right from the beginning, this is new work. So this is only the second time I've ever presented this. So I'm hoping to, to everyone can correct all the things I, I got wrong and give me good ideas for where to go next. Thank you. Thank you very much for this fascinating talk, Denny. It's really stimulating and very, very interesting. Uh, we have- uh, should, I, course, should, I, should I stop sharing or do you want me to keep the slides on? Or? However you wish, maybe if, People want to ask about some slides. If you want to go back, maybe we can. Okay, I'll it. stop sharing them and then so I can see people. Um, if, uh, yeah, we can give the priority to the audience if, if anyone has a question. Uh, can you use raise hand button or unmute yourself? Do you have any questions, Samir? I, I won't bite, by the way. Oh. <laughs> Hi, I Denise. Will, but, uh, I'll let Astrid go ahead. Oh, thank you, Samir. Yeah, hi, Denise. Thank you. Really, really enjoyed the talk. Um, I'm still not. I'm still not quite clear on sort of how fast learning has been sort of defined in the prior literature in humans. Mm -hmm. um, it almost kind of seems like a bit of a misnomer at times, because like as you sort of alluded to at one point, you know, learning implies that you use the information to guide these future behaviors. Um, so it really sounds like sort of true one shot learning is occurring in those animal studies that you mentioned, you know, where that sort of single experience then sort of dictates the future choices. Um, but I'm a bit unclear about it in humans, because I know that you mentioned a study where the label retention deteriorated after only about five minutes. Um, so I just wondered in those studies, how are they sort of distinguishing fast learning or like one shot learning in humans from from, say, just like uh, sort of working memory processes? Right. So um, I, I, you can tell where my beliefs lie. <laughs> um, so my original. So if there's someone here who who is an advocate of one shot learning, please do you know correct me. But um, I have to say when I I start, I, I said right at the beginning that I, I did something really naughty that you tell your students not to do. I started writing the chapter with the conclusion already in mind, and the conclusion was one stop one shot learning doesn't really exist. So that was where I was starting from. <laughs> okay, I accept that there is actually. Um, or in human, there is actually some evidence of um, of uh, learning from a few examples. And in fact, there's sometimes something called zero shot learning, which really I'm not quite sure what anyone means by zero shot learning. Um, but uh, 
you know, as far as I understand it, um, the examples that have been given the children are very short term. It's it's longer term, just working memory. Um, so, you know, the example I gave you, uh, the child's performance dropped after about five minutes. Um, but, it, you know, you, you do have examples of, of um, so, um, I've seen Josh Tenenbaum, who is a cognitive scientist from MIT, give an example about um, learning a new uh, word for an object that we don't know. It turns out to be a climbing word, and all of us can remember it by the end of the talk, right? Which is still an hour. My question, uh, but then we're, we're still within that context. Um, my question would be whether if you saw, you know, if you were asked that uh, what that object was a month later, um, out of the context, whether you would have, um, you know remembered it at all or not. So uh, yes, uh, as far as I know, in the context of children's word learning, it's all very short term. It's a bit longer than, than working memory. So it, it is you know, a, more credit than that. Um, but uh, there hasn't been that much long term retention studies. I think Thank you. Natasha has a question. So, Thank yeah. you. Um, yeah, there was a really, really interesting talk. Thank you so much. And um, I just agree with everything you just said. And so I, I'm almost so, just sort of following on from that in that uh, a lot of those um, kids studies, of course, are done in America or in the Western world. And uh, apparently, I mean, I, we've sort of really cautioned not to think too much about them because in fact, the fast mapping in terms of the language stuff just doesn't hold with, with multilingual children. Because of course they have lots of different words for the same object and they're constantly you know so if they you see two things you've already seen before and someone says oh this is you know comes up with your moodle idea um that could just be how it's said in the other language and so i've I'm, I'm just so obviously you've said it doesn't last for very long but i'm also very aware of the fact that i just don't think that in the most of the world it is actually how they are mapping things and that it is a much slower process yeah, I mean, I think, you know, uh, uh, since we agree, <laughs> but, you know, I, think, I think there is a role for, for, for fast mapping. And as, as I was trying to say, and that there are, you know, high salience events or high reward value events for whatever they are, um, you know, you need to encode them at least for a short enough time to determine whether they're actually something you should be learning or not. So that's basically what, what I think is going on. But I see there's another question, uh, Caroline? So yeah, so I'm muted myself. Um, yeah, so slightly a comment agreeing with what you say, really. Um, just from my children's experience, actually, um, I had a son and we took him skiing and he learned to ski and we went back about, he was probably about four at the time. And then we went back about a year or two years later and we thought, we'll just go up the mountain and um, we'll give him a go before ski school the next day. He had completely, utterly forgotten how to ski. He couldn't do anything at all. We were just stuck on a mountain with this child that couldn't come down. Um, and the same thing happened to my daughter who was swimming. Her grandmother taught her to swim when we were away for a short time. She could swim a width of a big public pool. Um, we didn't swim with her for about probably a month, two months after that. She couldn't swim at all. She <laughs> sank. So motor-wise, they definitely, what you're saying applies. If you don't actually use it, you just lose it. And uh, I mean, it's the same, isn't it, with GCSEs or A-levels. I can't remember anything of my GCSE or A-levels now because I'm not using half of it and I can't remember it. So... I imagine it's really the same. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you might remember some of the stuff from your GCSE. You just don't remember that you learnt it at GCSE. <laughs> it's... Yeah, maybe. Yeah, it's maybe true. But I, but I can't remember. If you gave me the exam, I probably couldn't do half of it now. Yeah, yeah. Some yeah. of them, anyway. Um, do you want yeah. to take some more questions, Vinny? Uh, because Sebastian, uh, yeah. on the chat box, Sebastian asked the first question. Sure. Uh, he asked, could you please briefly comment on the associations between the involved cognitive processes in executive functions trainings and fast or slow learning processes? Um, uh, silence. <laughs> so, yes, I mean... The um, question is not very clear. We can no, no, no. I'm just asking... What, I, so I'm assuming this asks... This is asking... I'm assuming, correct me if I'm wrong, Sebastian, whether I can say something about... Um, executive function i mean i don't basically i'll be honest i don't really see the link between executive functions training and fast and slow learning so i know that there are executive function training um uh, 
uh, gains or tasks or stuff so you can train executive functions and they are generally uh, require multiple um, so multiple episodes so it's more of an example of gradual learning and also I do if I remember correctly uh, I do think that um, the kind of uh, executive function training when they do have effects um, they have they only have close transfer not far transfer as well so you, you get better at doing the particular task you've been training on um, so but I'm not 100% sure how that maps onto the fast versus slow um, process I was talking about. I'm guessing that um, it would map, that would be more of an example of slow training because you need repeated trials. Um, so if you're thinking about training on uh, how to use the say whack-a-mole task, for example, um, I'm sure you need many examples of, of, you need to be playing it for a long time to get better at it. I can't imagine that, um, just doing it two or three times, and then suddenly you'd be much better. I mean, I'm not sure if I've answered your question correctly, but perhaps I didn't understand the the question as well. So please feel free to put in another comment to, to clarify. Shall we move on to the next yeah. question? Of course, yeah. Um, so Piraya asks, I'm also interested in multiple interacting systems for learning. Uh, my question my question is that uh, you mentioned HC as important for episodic memory, but what brain systems or networks do you think are involved in slow learning? Also, she asked, uh, what about the evidence for statistical slow learning in HC? Right. So that, that's that, that there are two good points there so first of all um in in the one of the one of the classic frameworks for kind of differentiating between slow and fast learning um in terms of computational models and neuro cognitive neuroscience evidence has suggested that kind of rapid learning occurs in the hippocampus so episodic one one shot type stuff and slow learning happens in the cortex now the cortex is big it's a big you know lots of different learning systems there right um, motor systems, you know, auditory processing, semantics, and so forth. Um, so I have, I think on my slides, one or two places I put the cortex as well. But I think slow learning happens in lots and lots of different places. Um, you know, I've got no problem with slow learning, some slow learning uh, occurring in the hippocampus as well. I'm not trying to make a one-to-one -one kind of function to structure uh mapping um i i'm I, largely i'm arguing that there are these functionally dissociable system um the slow learning in terms of episodes tends to load uh on uh the hippocampus more uh sorry the fast learning in terms of episodic turns to map onto the hippocampus and slow uh learning onto other cortical structures um but learning involves um you know all the different structures interacting so if for example reward value um, is uh, a gateway towards this. You'd also expect kind of amygdala involvement and, and so forth. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. I think the key thing is I'm really not trying to claim that there's a strong function structure uh, mapping. Um, yeah. Thanks for that. Thanks. Uh, shall we move on to the next question? Yeah, of course. Okay, in the chat box. Um, thank you for the great talk. I only joined later, so I'm sorry if if you already commented on this. Uh, how do these two learning principles connect to producing this knowledge? I'm thinking of other dual system theories in cognitive science, like uh, Kahneman's thinking fast and slow. In my intuition, I would say that the slow learning process is actually connected to the fast thinking process, system one, while the fast learning process is connected to uh, the slow thinking process, system two, uh, where the person has to effortfully, has to manipulate the memory con uh, contents? So um, that, that's a good question. Um, I, I, I don't really see a necessary association between um, the slow and the fast learning and the, the, the slow and the fast um, thinking. So if you give the, if you take the example of, of the, the kind of model that I just sketched out, um, it was, you know, the, the system had, there were two learning systems that were working collaboratively together, both together determining what the, out, the action selection response was going to be. So, um, 
you know, it's not like one system is fast at, at responding and the other system is slow at responding. In that particular case, they're working together for a single, um, single type of response. Um, what, and, and, you know, what they've stored in, in, the, in the deep neural network are kind of um, uh, gradual trends, generalizations that are accumulated over many, many, many examples. This is what you get in neural networks. So uh, general tendencies. And then what you've got in the hippocampal or, or uh, self-organizing map are instances, um, snapshots of, of parts of the problem that have high reward value that you weren't doing properly. So the, the other bit wasn't solving. And by putting these two things together, you get a kind of better overall performance. Um, but it says nothing about the speed at which the decisions are being made. Um, I don't know enough about the fast and slow. I mean, um, you know, my understanding is the, the, the slow processes generally involve more frontal um, reflective um, activity, um, probably, um, you know, sequencing, forward planning, sequencing together uh, lots of, um, of elements to a solution um, and inhibiting other elements or adjudicating between competing kind of possible solutions to the problem, whereas the fast system um, is probably driven uh, by um, uh, rapid associations. So um, this is another another part of my life, some work on conceptual learning that I'm doing and, and um, uh, high frequency misconceptions. You know, if I say something, if I tell, say the classic uh, question of what do cows drink? Well, even though you've all heard it many times, you still have the word milk popping in your head. And the answer is not milk, it's water, right? And what you, you have is that fast semantic association, which is high driven by high frequency association, which is giving that quick and dirty response. If you take some time, allow the frontal reflective system to kind of inhibit these initial uh, strong uh, associations, then you can get at a more kind of causally based uh, knowledge thing. So, um, I don't think, as I said, I don't think there's, there's necessarily a mapping between the fast and slow learning and the fast and slow responding. Um, the fast and slow learning is about how you get the knowledge in. The responding is about how you make use of that knowledge um, to you know, drive your behavior. But it's a good question. Um, Maybe if I can just comment on that again. Sure, of course. Um, because I, I thought that the slow learning process is basically the, the um, often repeated uh, associations that, that are in, in, the, in the world and then the, the fast response would be uh, just like activating this this uh, long built up association right because we, we always associate with cows with milk um, yeah. that, that's, um, that's but this is this has been slowly built up over time right and uh, yeah. the, uh, the quick response just stems from this uh, this close association that we've learned over time. And um, so, so I, I just connected these two uh, yeah, yeah. very quickly. And um, I, again, I, I see the the difference in in the other the other like pathway. But I think this one is very um, well. It it just just pops up <laughs> in, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I I completely agree with that. I mean, we can have knowledge that is deeply entrenched, so the association is very strong, but that knowledge could have been, I mean, uh, um, how that, yeah. Okay, I'll give you another example. Um, mm -hmm. The condition diversion of a food aversion. So I don't know if you're there, but like rats and, and humans as well, basically. Okay, um, rats, if, if they have food that they like and you put, um, and you, put you know, some um, noxious substance in it, they'll eat it once, they'll never eat it again. Um, you know, this is terrible, but once upon a time when I was a very young man, I got ma I drank way 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 too much of a particular alcohol and I cannot drink it anymore. So this is this is condition of earth. That's kind of rapid, effectively one shot learning, and it's very strong as well. So I think there's a dissociation between uh, those two, just because. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I completely agree. That that's completely true because there is also this very fast response to this very um, rapid learned. Uh, there can be yeah stimulus basically yeah. Great, thanks. True. I don't see any uh, raise hand anymore. Um, can I ask a short question? Of course. 
Um, so uh, my, my focus, my interest is in causal cognition, and you yeah. uh, briefly talk about causal relations. So th there are different kinds of relations, analogical relations, associations, and causal rela re relations. So causal relations are quite um, uh, deterministic, actually. A causes B to happen mm -hmm. it's, uh, most of the time, especially in physical world. I'm more interested in physical causality. So do you think that causal relations are uh, tend to be, be learned rapidly in the physical world or um well, so i think that's that's also good so I, I didn't really talk about the content of knowledge uh that much and and you're right i didn't i i, I used the word causal because i knew you guys were interested in that but um, so you can have you know a causal network things fit in um i think the point i was trying to make is that whether something is learned rapidly or not um is, is driven by the uh, the reward value of it. So I can imagine a causal relation. I can imagine that your causal network overall is very slow, okay? But I can imagine the specific causal relation will be learned very rapidly. So um, if you, um, I'm trying to, uh, I'm trying to think of an example of now, because I'm terrible, but if a, 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 you know, if a child, um, trying to climb up you know trying to reach something high they climb on the bookcase and the bookcase falls over on top of them right they're going to learn very quickly <laughs> a causal relation there and they will probably avoid it and i was trying to think of a positive example of that but i think if you have a highly reward charge and by that it can be positive or negative then you can learn that causal relation very quickly so um you know eating something will make you sick or uh, is the one that i'm fixating on as well but or you know um do this and you'll win a lot of money or something like that. These are, these are, are I think things that that's what's determining whether it's, it's, it's quick or not. Now, whether that causal relation about the, the child that's climbing on the bookcase, um, whether they really understand it in terms of connecting that cause and effect to their greater world knowledge of how objects interact. Um, I think, I'm not 100% sure. Um, I think it would depend on how well their kind of understanding of physical object interactions was already developed, or or or, or they might simply have developed a separate single step causal <laughs> causal domain where you know step on the bookcase get hurt um, sort of uh, thing. So again, I think I think most uh, my belief is that more uh, more complex causal systems will be gradually learned piece by piece, but you can have individual bits of causal relations, which are related to highly uh, reward charged things that you can learn very quickly. So, yeah. okay. so I think, you know, if you think about it in a classroom, um, uh, you know, and science museums know this. So, so some of the things, some of the best professors, science teachers are, are people who have a really kind of exciting, surprising thing. So I don't know. Um, you fill a balloon full of, of helium and then you put it on the Bunsen burner and it goes boom. <laughs> and, and that kind of marks uh, the event, um, which is remembered by the children uh, better. Possibly they enjoyed it, possibly they were scared, but suddenly that creates an episodic memory and, and that the knowledge around that kind of gets assimilated more than just droning on. I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but you know, if they just describe the thing without it, without any particular affect, then or showed it to them, but without any particular affect, it would take ages to be incorporated. That's a belief. Uh, so. Brilliant. Okay. Perfect. Um, if there's no question, we can end the session here. I can't Great. see anyone. That, that that was fascinating, Denny. Really, uh, we I enjoy so much. I hope uh, everyone enjoy. Thanks so much for the talk. And well, we hope to see you soon again. Great. Well, thank you for uh, inviting me. Right. Bye bye. Thank you very much.